All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as fascinating as talking about Arduino smell sensors are. So, today, uh, our bonus lecture topic is going to be machine learning. Um, I think I said this before, but just to say it again, because I think it's hilarious, I put up a poll with five options for different kinds of lectures that we could have, and we ended up with a four-way tie. So all I really learned was what you guys didn't want to hear about. Um, so yesterday we talked a little bit, of, or sorry, not yesterday, last week we talked a little bit about uh, network communication, TCP IP, all that kind of stuff. Today we're going to talk about machine learning and what it can do for you. Yes? Um, I think it was advanced DSP, which was uh, actually something that I was kind of hoping you guys would choose, but that's okay. Advanced DSP, we would have talked about things like matched filtering and linear predictive coding. These are, these are um, methods that allow us to do things like uh, LPC allows us to get an estimate of the, of the dominant frequency in a signal. So if you're trying to figure out like what frequency you're whistling at, you can do it by only analyzing like four or five data points. So it's obscenely fast. It gives you a really, really, uh, sm uh, not smooth, but a really uh, time localized estimate. So you know exactly at what point in time that's happening. And it's the stuff that's done in cell phones in order to turn your voice into like two kilobytes per second data. Maybe it's eight kilobits per second. Yeah, eight kilobits per second, that would be <coughs> one kilobyte per second of data. So it, does, it achieves very, very good signal compression by being able to model your voice uh, very efficiently. Match filtering is a technique that allows us to detect signals that we want to see. So if you have, say, like um, when your Wi-Fi, for instance, when Wi-Fi transmits from the, uh, from the laptop to the base station, it transmits a known preamble, which is a certain waveform that doesn't look like anything in nature. And so when you're receiving it and you want to know where that signal is, you know, whether it's the start of a new packet that's coming out or something like that, you can use matched filtering in order to have a detector that is very low for whenever that signal is not present and gets very high when the signal is present. So that's the kind of stuff that we would have talked about. Um, but instead, we'll talk about machine learning today, which is still pretty darn fun. So, uh, first off, there are not even like courses, but series of courses on machine learning. So we're just going to go over the very basic concepts, we're going to go over the simplest algorithms for machine learning, how we can use them, and of course we'll have a demo app that will hopefully work. Um, once you get used to machine learning, the mindset really stays with you because all of a sudden you realize all these algorithms that I write where I have some weird arbitrary threshold that tells me whether something's red or not, or I have some complicated algorithm that I throw data in and it tells me, okay, these patches of pixels are actually an A letter. All of that stuff goes away once you start uh, going into machine learning and you start to generalize everything into, I have data and I want to classify it as, is it an A or is it not an A? And so the study of machine learning is algorithms for one, training up models in order to be able to do this kind of thing, and then two, algorithms to use those models in order to classify data as class A or class B. So um, it's really funny because you can, you can state almost any kind of problem this way. For instance, the Wi-Fi, is there a frame here or not? Is there a packet here or not? That kind of thing. You could say, oh, I'm going to use match filtering to make a detector, blah, 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 blah. Or you could say, I'll have a whole bunch of data. I'll do machine learning on it, and I'll tell it, you know, this is where a frame is, this is where a frame isn't, and then it can do all the hard work itself. So let's get into it and talk about how this actually works. Um, because most of the work in machine learning for the, for the user, for the programmer, is setting up the problem in the beginning. After that, it's just a lot of CPU cycles for the phone or for the computer to actually do the training. So, machine learning. Um, I call solving problems, well, most of the problems that we solve as software engineers is computer programming plus knowledge. So knowledge is the kind of indefinable stuff that we bring to the process. We know what a face looks like, and we don't know how we know what a face looks like, but we do. We know there are two eyes, we know there's a nose, we know there's a mouth, etc. Um, 
there's a very famous computer programmer who once said, if you really want to know something, teach it to a computer, which is a takeoff of the, if you really want to know something, you teach it, old adage. Um, in this case, I think you guys are all pretty familiar with the difficulty of teaching a computer to do something even as simple as recognizing a red rectangle on the screen. So machine learning is what we use when we have no desire to take that knowledge that we have and try and instill it in computer algorithms. Machine learning is a generic way to try and learn knowledge on the fly for the computer. Um, so as I say here, this is where I say we teach computers things that we don't ourselves know. That's kind of a, an ironic way of saying that we don't necessarily have a foolproof algorithm where we can say, given these pixels, I have a step-by-step, -step, you know, compare this, add this kind of algorithm in order to say, yes, this is a face, no, this isn't a face. If we had such an algorithm that worked all the time, we'd just use that. But we don't, because sometimes faces are in shadow, sometimes faces are taken with a picture from the side, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we use machine learning to try and fix that, and oftentimes there are many difficulties with using machine learning which can make for some really non-functional situations, and we'll get to that at the, at the end. But amazingly, machine learning does work a lot of the time. So um, a lot of computer science researchers tend in like uh, doing on their PhD track and stuff, attack a lot of problems by, they say, I don't know how to solve this problem, let's just throw machine learning at it and see if it can do it instead. And this works some of the time, but Oftentimes, you can do better if you have the domain-specific knowledge in order to say, oh, I know that this signal always happens when this value is less than 5, so I can just make my own decision rule, and that will work all the time. If you don't know that kind of knowledge, then you have to turn to machine learning. And so, we're going to phrase all of our problems as what are called classification problems. That's where you have a chunk of data, and you want to label it as, is this category A, is this category B, is this category C? For instance, if you want to do a face detection problem, you could have category A mean there's a face in this block of pixels. You can have category B mean there is not a face in this block of pixels. And then if you want to find faces in a picture, you divide the picture up into as many little chunks of pixels as you want, and you classify each chunk independently. Does everyone see how that works? All right. Um, even on just classification problems. There's multiple different ways of doing this. Of course, you can have multiple classes. You can have what's called supervised versus unsupervised learning. We're only going to talk about supervised learning because it's a little more classical and it's a lot less complicated. Supervised means that when I'm training it up, I have to give it data that I say, these are examples of class A, these are examples of class B. And then once it learns what separates class A and class B, then it can actually perform the classification. Unsupervised would be where I give it a whole bunch of data, and it looks at the data and says, huh, these data points look different from these data points. I'm going to turn those into two classes. Clearly, that's what we humans do. We take a look at data as we're growing up as children and such, and we just kind of naturally figure out that, oh, this is one object, this is another object. They're not the same thing. But we haven't quite got... Unsupervised learning is kind of the holy grail of machine learning but uh, it's still a work in progress, as is supervised learning, but everything continues apace. So we're going to start with the simplest, most direct approach, which is supervised learning with two classes. And as I said before, we can treat this identical to a detection problem. We want to detect something and not detect it when it's not there. So almost all machine learning algorithms, certainly all the ones that we're going to talk about today, use the same basic approach, which is you take your data, and you transform it into what's called a feature vector. Then you label each feature vector as either class 0 or 1 and perform some kind of magic to construct what's called a model off of this training data. Once we have that model, we can use it to classify other feature vectors as either class 0 or 1. So from our perspective, most of this work is in that first part where we say construct feature vectors of our data. Because if you are using a machine learning algorithm library, then steps two, three, and four are not going to be much work at all, because it's going to do all the work for you. So for us as people who are dealing with data and trying to classify it and such, we are going to, the work is going to be on us to decide what makes a good feature vector, 
what kind of data am I going to feed in and what classes I'm going to use. When I say classes here, I don't mean like C-sharp classes. I mean like uh, signal there or signal not there, that kind of class. So feature vectors are representations of our data. So for instance, if we were trying to do speech recognition, our data could be a chunk of audio samples, maybe 480 samples, just for fun. Um, feature vectors are where we take that data and we somehow transform it into a different format that will hopefully work better for machine learning. We could consider this that those 480 samples of data as, oh, we'll just take this and do machine learning on it and we'll hope that the machine learning algorithm can look at one 480 section of data, look at another 480 sample section of data, and then separate the two and say, yes, this, this chunk of data is the word barn, and this chunk of data is not the word barn. We could do that, but it doesn't work very well for reasons that we'll soon see. So just as an example to stop talking in uh, really hypothetical and abstract terms, let's assume that the data that we are working on is a, uh, data that was taken by somebody who went around with a grip strength monitor and says, all right, I'm going to collect data points where each data point is a person and the data that I have is their left hand grip strength, their right hand grip strength, their age and their gender. And I'm going to take that data and represent it as a vector. So for each data point, which is a person, we're transforming it into a feature vector, which is going to be four numbers. The four numbers are age, gender, right hand and left hand grip strength. I guess gender zero can be male and one can be female or something. So that's the transformation from data to feature vector. We then take our training points, we label them, and we then are going to do some method of visualizing the data. So when we have like n dimensional data, because right here we have four dimensional data, it's pretty hard to visualize that. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at two or three dimensions at a time. So here's an example of, that, of such a data set where we have right grip strength versus age on the bottom left and left grip strength versus right grip strength on the bottom right and the color denotes female versus male. Now, when we are setting up this problem, we could say what we want to do is we want to be able to measure someone's right hand grip strength, left hand grip strength and their age and tell whether or not they are male or female. That's the kind of question that machine learning would be able to answer. So we feed this data into it, and then we, get, then we take some random person, we measure their right hand, left hand, and then we ask them their age, and it will plot something, say, right here. And so if it plots something right there, we can pretty confidently say they're a man. Because all of the points around here are male, and all the points around here are female with a few outliers around the middle. This is what's called separable data. And this is exactly the kind of thing that you want with machine learning. Because all of machine learning boils down to, I have all these points in this space like this, and I try and draw a line between those two spaces, between those two subspaces. And if I can do that and correctly classify most of my data on one side of the line, the rest of the data on the other side of the line, then we have a machine learning problem that we can solve. And from there, we now have a pretty good model for where we can say, all right, given your left hand grip strength, right hand grip strength, and your age, I can pretty much figure out whether you're male or female. And that's exactly the kind of problem that we want to solve. You may notice over here, it's not quite as easy. For instance, if we just did right hand grip strength versus age, you can see that um, the, there is still a separation here. But if I didn't have right hand grip strength or left hand grip strength, and all I had was age, right? So that means I have to draw a line like this. There's no really good way that I can separate the data, which makes a lot of sense, right? If I ask you your age, and that's the only information I know, there's no way whether I'm going to be able to tell if you're male or female. So a good part of machine learning is coming up with intelligent features to use in order to make your data separable. So in this case, right hand grip strength is all the data we really need in order to, to tell apart these pieces of data. 
because if I if all I can do is draw a line along this axis, which is right hand grip strength, then I can still do it. I can say, okay, my boundary point's going to be here, and I would be able to get somewhere around you know 80, 90 percent accuracy, something like that. Using left and right hand grip strength, I can draw a line like this, which may do a little bit better. And if I include age into that, we suddenly get into a three-dimensional space, and I may be able to do a, even a little bit better. It's hard to tell right here, but we can see there is definitely a correlation between age and right-hand grip strength, so adding in that extra information won't hurt. It is hard to visualize, though. So, as I was saying before, separability is key. If things aren't what's called linearly separable here, a lot of algorithms won't work. There are some algorithms that will work, but a lot of them won't work. So let's take a look at one of the algorithms that is kind of the first, um, first line of defense against things like this. Uh, it's called k-nearest neighbors. So k-nearest neighbors is where I have my training points. So in here, red triangles are, um, red triangles are class 1. Blue rectangles are class two, and my green circle is something that I don't know which one it is. So that's my training point, and everything else, or sorry, that's my testing point, and everything else are my training points. K nearest neighbors doesn't do linear separability or anything like that. All it does is it looks at the K closest points, takes a majority vote, and then that is what decides what this new point is. So in this case, if I'm looking at the three nearest neighbors, I'm looking at everybody within this circle. And I've got two red triangles, one blue rectangle. And so given this training data, it would say, all right, this point is a red triangle. The dotted line is here to show you that if your points aren't well separated in your space, you're still going to run into problems. Because if we look at the five closest neighbors, then suddenly we get these three blue guys and only two red guys, and our class switches. Does everybody get this idea in this graphic? Okay. Is your lecture recorded? Yeah. So, let's talk about model construction. So, models are what separate our classes in the feature space. So, if it's a linear classifier, that means that it draws hyperplanes. Hyperplanes meaning if you're in a three dimensional space, it's a two dimensional object, which is a line. If you're in a four-dimensional space, it's a three-dimensional object, which is a plane. If you're in a five-dimensional space, it's a four-dimensional object, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, oh, this is actually backwards. Anyway, so this, uh, this k-nearest neighbors uh, idea is all about the distance from our training point to the points around us, right? It's going to take all the points in our training data. It's going, to, um, it's going to sort them by distance from, the, from that test point, And then it's going to take the majority vote. This really begs the question, what does distance actually mean? Because we're talking about this very abstract, multidimensional space. If we go back to this data set that we have here, We've got right grip strength, which is in kilograms, age, which is in years, um, and we're just kind of plotting them as two different axes. So I have points right here, and if my training point is right where my cursor is, we can say, all right, that cursor is pretty, oh, can you see the cursor on the screen? Okay. That cursor is pretty close to a red point just off to the right of it. That distance is in years, but the distance to those two red points that are directly underneath it is a distance that's in kilograms. So we can, of course, just assign numbers to these things and then calculate Euclidean distance, right? We can take the sum of the squares of the distances of each dimension. That's not necessarily what you want to do. For instance, in the example application that I'm going to be showing in a little bit, one of the dimensions is the uh, yaw of the phone, like the compass, which way it's pointing. The number that it returns to you is in radians. The radians go from like, you know, pi, pi over 2, 0, and then come back up to 2 pi, 
as I pass from zero to from zero degrees to 359 degrees. So if I just take the sum of the squares of the distance, it's going to give me an extremely large distance for this and an extremely small distance for this. Because when I'm over here, this direction may be at zero at one degrees, this direction may be at 359 degrees, right? That wraparound gives me problems. This is just one example of why choosing your, what's called your distance metric, is really important. Deciding how far away two points are in your feature space is not always as easy as doing the sum of the squares of the differences. Um, in this case, I don't actually do any kind of fancy angle uh, arithmetic, which I really should be. I'm just doing the sum of the squares of the differences, and it still kind of works for some things. When I say some things, I mean it still kind of works as long as I avoid that wraparound area, which is not something that you should, that you should be doing in a real product. You should be, of course, you know, doing the comparison that will say two angles that should be close to each other are actually close to each other. Um, and, of course, and so here's that, uh, that picture idea of what a linear classifier means. A linear classifier is where we have these points in this multi dimensional space. I draw a hyperplane between them, and then I can make a decision, oh, the red balls are below this plane, the blue balls are above this plane. This is all really abstract, um, but that's how machine learning is. You take all of your real-world measurements, throw them into this abstract space, try and cluster them together into, here's a cluster of yes, here's a cluster of no, and I take my point and try and figure out which one is it closer to. So, before we move on, I just want to make a note. There are some data sets that are just straight up non-linearly separable. A non-linearly separable data set, uh, if you try and use some kind of linear algorithm to separate these two, won't work very well. So if I, tr if I try and have a linear classifier where I draw a line and say, okay, everything below that line is red, everything above that line is blue, of course, I'm not going to do very well. There are ways to get around this, and we'll talk about it later. But first, we're going to look at an example application of how you might do this kind of thing in code. So, there is a sample app called K Nearest Neighbors that I was frantically working on about 15 minutes before class to try and get it working. You'll be happy to know that it is uh, working. One of the problems is I can't run it on the emulator because it uses all of the sensors on the device. So if I try and run it on the emulator, um, it's not going to work. It'll pop up with some error or something like that. And the reason why is because I am using the motion detector, the motion sensor, right here. This is the, oh wow. Wow, it really didn't like that. Well, it seems to be continuing on like a champ anyway, so let's do the same. So this motion object belongs to the Microsoft Advices.Sensors namespace. And this motion object takes the gyroscope, accelerometer, and compass and combines them all together. There we go. Could not initialize motion API. That's a little pop-up box that I added, and it quits out. Okay, cool. Um, this motion object requires the compass, accelerometer, and GPS. And the motion API gives you the acceleration, the rotational acceleration, or rotational velocity, excuse me, and the orientation of the device, what they call the attitude. And the reason why it's nice to use this motion thing instead of the raw sensors themselves is because it will actually combine them all together in intelligent ways. So for instance, when I get the this what's called this attitude idea, it will actually give me a vector that if I turn the phone like this, it'll point up like this and then stay there. So it'll actually do kind of like the integration as you move around with the sensors in order to figure out which direction the phone is, is pointing in, the absolute direction that it's pointing in, based on the compass and the gyroscope and the accelerometer. It will remove the effect of gravity, if it can, from the accelerometer output so that you don't always have a huge accelerometer uh, vector pointing straight down. 
it will give you a gravity vector on the side, and then it will, it will subtract that out, and then we'll try and give you an accelerometer reading that will, you know, going like this will go from between negative 1 and positive 1, instead of between like negative 9 and negative 8, which is what the normal accelerometer would do. Um, so that's fantastic. And it, uh, it's pretty straightforward in how you use it, right? You just have this, you create a new motion thing, you tell it how quickly you want it to update, you subscribe to its current value change function, and then you say start. And when it calls current value changed, here we go, it gives you in one of those sensor reading event arg things that has like a e dot sensor reading thing like that. Okay, let's talk about how the code deals with taking data in and turning it into a feature vector. In this case, my feature vector, which I call fv, is going to be a floating point object with two entries. So I'm only, I'm only going to keep track of two things, so I'm in a two-dimensional space. It used to be a nine-dimensional space, but I didn't get that working, so now I'm using a two-dimensional space. The two-dimensional space is going to get assigned to by two different things. I have one thing called accelerometer vector magnitude, which just takes my r.deviceacceleration.x, squares it with math.pow, then takes y and z, adds them all up as they're squared, and leaves them squared, apparently. So it's, it's just the squared magnitude of your acceleration vector, which means it gets big when you move the phone around, and it's small when you don't move the phone around. The other one is r.attitude.yaw, and we just throw that in as our second entry into our feature vector, just straight up. So that will go from like 0 to 2 pi, and then wrap around again. And that's our feature vector. That's how we take our data, which is this motion reading thing, and turn it into a float array. Then, um, let's take a look at the XAML so we have an idea of what this app is going to do. We're, we'll plot our input data up here, and clicking this button will just change between accelerometer or gyroscope or however you want to visualize your input data. That's just fun because I like drawing a lot of line graphs. Then down here we have this thing called record positive sample and record negative example. When I click record positive example, it'll go beep, 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 and then start recording. And when I say start recording, I mean the data that's being sent in from that motion sensor will start getting added to a list of example vectors that are called positive <coughs> examples. So I can take the phone and I can say point it in this direction. And it will start you know, recording data, I'll hit stop. Then I'll take the phone and point it in this direction. I'll hit uh, record negative example. Then after a while, I'll hit stop. And then what it has is it has two lists of feature vectors. One where we have a bunch of feature vectors that are labeled as positive. One where we have a bunch of feature vectors that are labeled as negative. And then when we tell the program, OK, we'll press this button and say classify, every time it gets a new input uh, set of data from the motion sensor, it's going to run that through k-nearest neighbors, look at all of our previous, or look at all of our previously recorded positive and negatives. It will find the k-nearest uh, examples, the k-nearest training vectors, and it'll see, do I have more positive ones or more negative ones? And from that, it'll make a decision as to whether the current input is positive or negative. And if it's positive, it will be. If it's negative, it'll be silent. So... Um, I know you guys can't see the phone and its beautiful GUI, but you guys can take a look at that later if you want, maybe during the break. So the first thing I do is I say record positive. And so it's recording a bunch of positive stuff right now. So then I'll hit stop. And I'll say, okay, record negative. And then I'll hit stop. And then, if it works, when I hit classify, it makes a tone, and then it stops making a tone. And so, the beauty of this is that... No, stop. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty of this is that I didn't put in any kind of... Um, any kind of thresholds or anything to say, when my yaw gets below a certain value, 
then start beeping. And when a yaw gets above a certain value, start beeping, that kind of thing. All I did was I said, here's the yaw data that I recorded when you should beep. Here's the yaw data that I recorded when you shouldn't beep. And it figured out all the rest itself. Now, it's not by any means perfect. Of course, sensor, noise, non-separability, all these things can get in the way, and we won't be able to properly identify our data as belonging to class 1 or class 2. But it can be uh, pretty, it can be made to work pretty well, given that you've recorded good sets of data, given that it is actually separable, and given that you've gotten your machine learning algorithms to run in fast enough time. So this is a pretty simplistic idea. And because I'm recording the accelerometer, we should be able to do things like shake it a whole bunch during the positive examples, then not shake it during the negative examples, and then say, OK, classify. And then it'll be silent when it's sitting there, and it'll start beeping when I shake it. But I'm not going to try that because I'm pretty sure it won't work as it is right now because, I have, uh, because I'm reading from the uh, yaw as well as the accelerometer. You know what? We can try it. We can go into here, and we can disable reading from the yaw, so we're only reading from the accelerometer, and do it only from the accelerometer. Because I'm pretty sure the yaw would screw us up otherwise. All right. Let's find where you, OK, so here's where we calculate the future vector. So instead of reading in from the yaw, we'll just assign future vec the future vector uh, number 1 to be 0 all the time. So this guy will never change. And this guy will be the acceleration magnitude vector. And it's trying to build it on the emulator. So let's try it on the device instead. So, for the positive example, I'm going to shake it like this. And then for the negative example, I'm just going to have it be still. All right. So now when I hit classify, <laughs> it actually works. <laughs> That's actually pretty cool. All right. Sweet. Uh, that turned out better than I expected. Cool. So machine learning works, guys. That's the takeaway from this. Uh, in this case, I am because k-nearest neighbors is not the smartest algorithm, right? K-nearest neighbors looks at, this isn't an example of k-nearest neighbors, but we could consider, you know, I'm looking at everything within this, uh, Everything within a little bubble. Here, let's go to the actual k-nearest neighbors. We're looking at everything within that little bubble, ignoring everything else around you. Better machine learning algorithms take a look at all of the data. So we are going to look at what are called support vector machines. Support vector machines are a kind of state-of-the-art machine learning algorithm where we're able to look at all of the data for our, uh, for our training and make a decision that is not inherently bound to be linear. So what I mean by that is we have this two-dimensional data here where we've got some red near the origin and blue everywhere else. And we want to uh, find a decision boundary. So previously, when we were talking about linear classifiers, our decision boundaries were linear, which means that we have to draw a line that separates the two things. We can't do that with this data set. However, what support vector machines do is they do what's called the kernel trick. They take the data, they run it through a kernel, which is just a fancy word for a function that you apply to every data point, and it takes in two-dimensional data and spits out three-dimensional data. And so here what they've done is they've taken this two-dimensional uh, space here, and they've wrapped it around a cone that's going like this in three-dimensional space. And what that means is things near the origin will be towards the tip of the cone, Things that are farther out will be farther out along the cone. Then in this three-dimensional space, they can draw a line, which is a plane. 
and they can separate the blue from the red. Who has no idea what just happened? Because it took me a couple times looking at this to figure out what was going on. So you guys are all super confident about this. Okay, let me, let me just draw it out with a, with a marker real quick. I've got something that doesn't write. Can you guys see that at all? I, I can't see it. Yeah, I still can't see it. Let's try one piece. There we go. So I've got data where I've got red stuff close to the origin here. And I've got blue stuff that's a little farther out. I can take this two-dimensional space and map it to three-dimensional space where I've got x, y, and z, right? x, y, z. And this is, say, x and y over x. We'll call it x1, x2, because these coordinates really have nothing to do with these. And what I'm doing is I'm making a cone. So that's something that comes out like this. Right? And it's circular, like that. And I take these points and project them onto this cone. So what I mean by that is, um, I could say y, my, my function could be like, y is equal to x1, x is equal to x2. So these, these axes are going to be these axes, so if I do that, then I have to redraw my cone. Just a minute. My cone is instead going to look like this. So x is x1, y is x2, or the other way around, whatever, and then z is going to be equal to x, man, I, I can't read it at all. Let me draw it through. z is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared. So what that means is a z value here will be 0. A z value here will be 1. A z value here will be 1. A z value here will be like 2. Right? So the farther we get away from the origin, the higher we get. And so if x is x2 and y is x1, then when we draw the red guys, they will be like right here. And when we draw the blue guys, they will be like right here on the cone. And so then I can take a line that's just in Z, a plane, that's like this. Oh my gosh. We're going to put these guys over here so we don't touch them again. And so this decision boundary will separate the blue and the red. And it's linear. And that's the important part, is that we take something that's not linearly separable in a low dimensional space, we move it into a higher dimensional space, and all of a sudden it's linearly separable if we found the right transformation function, give, given that this is the right transformation function, we did find it. Does that make sense to everybody now? Cool. Question. It makes sense, but uh, can we use polar as well? Yeah. You can use whatever kind of transformation functions you want. Support vector machines have a certain library of transformation functions that they use. One of them is called the RBF kernel, which is like you take your data and you multiply it by e to the whatever, and it's got this parameter alpha, and this parameter gamma, that change how much it warps this way and that. It's the kind of stuff that um, people who are much better at math than me uh, think about in their spare time. That's not the right one. Is that the right one? We'll just go back to that one. All right. Um, and it's the kind of thing that we will never, ever implement on our, on our own because there's a really good uh, libraries that will do this kind of thing for us, 
but we have to understand the basics. We have to understand that it is a function that's doing the warping for us and then finding linear boundaries. Oh, by the way, the reason why we're finding linear boundaries instead of doing something like, say, we can see this is a circle. So you can say, why not do a search for a circle that separates them? Does anyone have any idea why you wouldn't just do that instead? Instead of trying to find a line, just find a circle that separates them. Because we don't know that should be a circle. That's true. We don't know that it should be a circle. And we don't know that it should be a line. So instead we just say, we'll always assume that it's a line. And anything that's not a line will turn into a line. Right? And any decision boundary that's not a line, so in this case it's a circle, will turn into a line by doing this. And that's what I mean. Um, because um, we want we want something aligned to separate regions. And uh, instead of find another um, like a circle or something else to separate two regions, we find a line and we want to use uh, some kind of trans transformation function and lines to just want to make it uniform, I think. Yes. The other reason is it's much more computationally efficient to find a line to separate things than just normal, than just some arbitrary nonlinear surface. So, especially in higher dimensions, finding lines or spheres or hyperspheres in order to separate stuff is really, really computationally expensive. Finding hyperplanes is much less computationally expensive. So that's great. So that's why we use things like SVMs. So. This brings us along to LibSVM. LibSVM is a programming interface for support vector machines. So it's going to give us things like SVM model, SVM parameter, SVM problem, all this kind of stuff. There's actually a C Sharp library that you can use on Windows Phone in order to do this kind of thing. So the recipe for kind of using LibSVM in order to solve more kind of problems is we load all our training data into SVM node structures. That's our step one, where we take our training data and we turn it into feature vectors and store them in these things called SVM nodes. We load these SVM node structures into an SVM problem, which is where we say, okay, our problem is here are my classes. I've got class one and class two, and I want to separate the two of them. You use what's called cross-validation to search for good values for SVM parameters. So these parameters are these machine learning parameters that we have to search for, which is these uh, um, projection functions, where we go from low dimension to high dimension. As I said before, if you're using the RBF kernel, then you have like a parameter that's called gamma and a parameter that's called, I think it's C or alpha or something like that. Once you've found good SVM parameters for your SVM problem, you can generate something called an SVM model which is where it stores all the parameters, stores all the training data, all that kind of stuff. And then you have this thing called an SVM model. And that can be used to classify an SVM node. So just like we saw in the um, K nearest neighbors example, here we get data in, we turn it into an SVM node, then we take the SVM node and we have an SVM model act on it and decide whether or not it's class A or class B. And of course, there are bindings for libSVM in a million languages. We're going to do it in C-sharp. Um, so as I said before, there are a bunch, of different linear, or a bunch of different kernel types. So if you use a linear kernel, that means that all you're going to be doing is performing linear transformations on your object, which means that you're not going to be doing any of this kind of warping from low dimension to high dimensional space. So you would choose a linear kernel type if you already know that your data is linearly separable. In that case, you can use this kind of uh, software really, really quickly. Because you don't have to search for all the parameters to do this kind of thing. You can just straight up linearly separate your data. Hooray. If you're not so lucky, you have to use like polynomial or RBF, uh, or RBF um, kernel types. This would be what's called polynomial RBF, or a polynomial kernel type. Because we have x1, x2, x1 squared plus x2 squared. Those are all polynomials. So that's the, that's the kind of kernel type that, a, uh, that polynomial would find. Uh, yeah, so it looks like it is a C parameter and a gamma parameter. Great. Those mean basically nothing to us. 
there is a short guide by the authors of LibSCM that say, we know you guys don't want to deal with the icky gross math stuff. So when you're looking for good parameter values, just have C go from like 0 to 1 and gamma go from like negative 1 to positive 1 or something like that. They are very accommodating. And the short guide is right here in case any of you guys end up wanting to use LibSVM to do any kind of machine learning in any of your final projects or in the future. Uh, LibSVM really is one of those kind of industry standard um, kind of state-of-the-art libraries that you can use to attack these kinds of problems. And so, after I have talked up uh, machine learning and we have had some absolutely brilliant live demos, I should point out that there are a few caveats to this kind of thing. The first is what's called overfitting. So overfitting is what happens when your model is too complex, and so you get models that match your training data a little too well. So in this case, we've got the red class and the green class. A too complex model will find a decision boundary that looks something like this, right? And so then we ask, okay, is this yellow dot green or red? And it'll actually say red. So things like k-nearest neighbors will never do this, right? Because the k-nearest neighbors model doesn't have it in it to make a decision boundary like this. But something like support vector machines might, can, given if you have enough dimensions in your data and, it's, and you uh, have enough data and such, it might find something that looks like this. So instead, you want to get something, of course, that looks like this, right? Where we have a nice decision boundary that for us as humans, matches what we would expect our machine learning algorithm to get. Everybody understand this? Why overfitting is a problem? Yeah, exactly, because it'll make the, the yellow dot red, when, we, when it obviously should be green. So the way to get around this is through something called cross-validation. Now, overfitting is typically the fault of some kind of parameters in your algorithms. You have, say, very high test scores for all of your testing data, right? That's how you evaluate your model. The way that machine learning algorithms work is they come up with a bunch of models, they find which one has the highest testing accuracy, and they choose that model as saying, okay, here's the model, here's the decision boundary that works really well for your data. In this case, um, when your model is uh, overfitting like this, you are getting extremely high values for your testing data, for, sorry, for your training data, but then when we have some data that wasn't a part of that exact set, you get a really low accuracy. You, you classify it as red. So, cross-validation is where when you are finding your model parameters, you train up on, <coughs> say, 90% of your training data and you leave your 10% training data aside. Then, after you've trained up a model to work really well on that 90% of data, you'll take that 10% and you'll put it into the, uh, into the classifier. And you'll make sh sure that you get good results on those pieces of data as well. The reason why this works is because you're keeping a, a, a bit of your data off to the side, so then the data that you are training up on you don't know exactly where those po points of data are, and so in order for you to get good results on your training data and good results on this training data that you've held aside, your model has to be able to generalize well to the rest of your population. And so most people do what's called tenfold cross-validation, which is where you divide your data up into ten equally sized pieces, and you train on nine of them and test on this guy, then train on nine of the others, test on this guy, train on nine of the others, test on this guy, so you kind of each uh, tenth of your data takes a turn being the odd one out, and you just choose the model that does the best from all those ten different models. So this kind of uh, training gets pretty computationally expensive because all of a sudden we just, um, I, don't, I forget how to say uh, ten in Latin. We didn't octuple, we like uh, deck tuple or something like that, our uh, workload, because we're performing the same operations 10 times, just on a slightly smaller data set. 
and then we have to evaluate it by the data that we held, we held off. Um, and this is the reason why most of the time we don't do machine learning training on the phone. Now, I'm about to do machine learning training on the phone, but for most real-world applications, you don't really want to do that. Because, as we'll see, I'm going to try and do a speech recognition test on the phone just using SVM. So we take data from, from the LibSound, we throw it into SVM, and we try and get it to differentiate one set of words with another set of words. And uh, the training, when I did this last year, it took like a minute, maybe, or maybe a minute and a half in order to generate the model that it was going to use to classify stuff from then on. And then in order to take the sound that I had uh, captured and decide, it takes much, much less time, maybe a second or two. But this is the kind of computational task that will very quickly turn your phone into a uh, you know, red-hot iron sitting in your pocket, crunching away at all these numbers. So this is the kind of thing that we usually do on a computer that the phone talks to. This is why, for instance, when you use Siri or when you use uh, Microsoft's speech recognition, Cortana, right? Um, when you say, like, you know, Siri, um, where's the nearest gas station? It will just take your data, compress it, and then ship it off to a computer somewhere to do the machine learning on it over there. Because this is exactly the kind of stuff that goes on inside of a speech recognition processor. It will take your audio data, chunk it up into frames, take those frames, turn them into feature vectors, take those feature vectors, do classification on them to turn them from raw waveforms into phonemes into words, that then go into a language model where it says, okay, given that you said the quick brown fox and the next word looks like dumps, I'm going to guess that it's jumps because I see the quick brown fox jumps a whole lot more than I see the quick brown fox dumps, that kind of thing. It does all this kind of stuff on the computer and then sends you back a text. Okay, let's try another risky live demo. Uh, these are my favorite, of course. So we're going to look at this single word C sharp file. So this is a pretty huge C sharp file that I wrote last year um, that does, well, tries to do speech recognition using libsvm. It's a lot of code. So if you guys don't look through everything, I won't blame you. But if you're interested about something, feel free to ask me because uh, this one shows off a couple of interesting uh, possibilities. So this one I think I actually can run the emulator so we can see what's going on. Let's see if we can get it working. What we're going to do is we're going to record audio snippets and we're going to classify them as either positive or negative. And then once we've done that, it's going to build up a model that will decide whether something is a positive example or a negative example. And then it will take that data and perform live classification of the audio input stream and will tell us when we say the word that it's been taught to recognize. Or at least that's the hope. So let's see if it's still working after all these months. <clears throat> all right, so we've got a positives pane, and we've got a negatives pane, and we've got a testing pane, where you can see the audio scrolling across like that. Uh, I kind of went crazy with the, um, with the whole line graph thing on this project, so it will actually slow down your phone quite a bit running this because we've got, we're plotting like, I forget how many it is, a couple thousand points at least here. So, uh, I'm going to try and teach it the word uh, this, and then I will give it a couple examples that are positive of this, and then I'll give it a couple of negative examples that are just like silence or me saying hello or something like that. So that it gets a good example of what's not this and what is this. Because if I don't give it any negative examples, it'll just classify everything as positive. So let's try it. This. 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 
Okay, so I guess I'm actually getting cut off a little bit. So I think I need to uh, delete these. Yeah, so there are a couple of uh, things going on here that we haven't seen before. For instance, it's storing all of this data on disk so that if I close the app and open it again, the data is still there. We have a scrollable list down here of waveforms that you'll be able to look at and delete items from and stuff like that. So all this kind of UI stuff we haven't really talked about in class, but the code is available here that's commented, and I can, of course, answer questions if you guys want to do the same kind of thing in your final projects. So let's try this again. This. 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 All right. Maybe that's good enough. Now for negatives. Hello. It might not be enough, but let's just go ahead and see what happens. So now we tell it to learn. And so the button will stay red while it's still learning off in a background thread. Um, we'll still have the testing going on. And I think the text block is going to tell us when it uh, decides that I've said the word this and when it hasn't. So as I said before, it takes quite a few seconds for it to process through all that data. And internally, what it's doing, I think, is it's taking the data that we that I collected as audio, it's chunking it up into uh, segments, it's doing an FFT on those segments, then like summing over ranges of the FFT to get a coarser representation of the FFT, and then just throwing that into an SVM. So the units that we have along all the different directions of our, all the different dimensions of our feature vector are like how much energy is in the lower part of the FFT, how much energy is in the higher part of the FFT, that kind of thing. It's not a particularly uh, clever way of doing speech recognition. There are well-defined methods for doing this kind of thing where you want to separate words. They're called MFCCs. They stand for Mel Frequency Capstral Coefficients. And that's another kind of thing that we would do if we, did an, if we did an advanced DSP day, but it's so focused on speech recognition that it would probably bore you guys all to tears. Um, Needless to say, speech recognition is not the most fascinating thing that you can research nowadays. Uh, but there are still a lot of people researching it because Apple and Google really want to be able to understand what you're saying. Um, wow, it is still learning. How did you get it to function while it's learning? You said you shipped the data off somewhere, or is it actually crunching it on the laptop? It's actually crunching on the laptop. So it's just spinning up a background thread and doing all the crunching in the background thread. So it's the, you know, it's the kind of thing that we do when we have our user interface still working while we've got you know, a lib camera or a lib video thing going. Man, this is taking a while, isn't so it? Did you, did you uh, send, send, send the data and throw it in you know, one of the libraries and Yep. So how do you decide, I assume there are many different models in there from the library, how do you decide which one to pick? So the only thing that I have to pick is what kind of nonlinear warping function do I want to use, right? I can use a linear non I can use a linear warping function, I can use a polynomial warping function, or I can use an RBF warping function. So how do you know that out of the three? How do RBF you know? is the one that most people use because it's the most general. The only reason you'd want to use polynomial or linear is if you know that will solve your problem because those ones will go faster. Like this step will take less time using a polynomial or linear one, but they have less flexibility. So how is the last one, RS? RBF. <laughs> how, do you, like, how do you know, uh, how, how is that different from the other two models? I mean, you just, I mean, we all understand linear and polynomial, but yeah. what, is the, what is that last one? What does that even mean? <laughs> So an RBF kernel is a radial basis function kernel, and it looks like this mathematically. But let's let's find a let's find a picture of it. This is what an RBF kernel looks like. So it will take your two-dimensional grid and put it in three dimensions like that, or or higher dimensions, or higher dimensions, or higher dimensions. The reason this tends to work is because most of the data that we deal with does tend to cluster somehow like this. Like the, tend to, the data that we, that we look at tends to be close together somehow. But it could be close together in a blob or close together in whatever. And so we can take this shape, 
squeeze and stretch it in whatever different way we want so that the stuff that we want is high up and the stuff that we don't want is down low, then we can cut that with a linear decision boundary. Yours is doing this on the fast forward transfer data based on different frequency energy. Yep. Okay. yep, exactly. Uh, I'm having a really difficult time believing that it's taking this long, actually. So I think something may have crashed. Unfortunately. So I'm just going to try it one more time, and then we can, if it uh, still stays on the learn thing a whole bunch. So again, we, uh, oh, I think actually, if you click on these, this, yeah, it'll actually say what you recorded. This. Which isn't particularly nice, but whatever. It's just like hello there. I mean, almost. So these things are the waveforms, right? So this is just taking the audio data and plotting it. Oh, okay. So we have, uh, we have you know, large variants where there's a lot of energy in the signal, basically. <clears throat> uh, so let's try learning once more. No, it's being really stubborn. I don't, I don't really know what its problem is, but uh, I guess we'll have to fix it later. So that's too bad that it's not working. So the thing that you're trying to pass in for us to do the learning on is you, you do the FFT and all that outside and then you pass the data after it's been FFT into it? Right. So machine learning algorithms work on feature vectors. That's everything that we do is we just take our input data, no matter what it is, and we turn it into just a sequence of floating point numbers. Because machine learning things, all they do is they work in these arbitrary, large dimensional spaces. So, for instance, you know, right here, we've got one dimension here, one dimension here. So, we could take two, um, we could take two elements of my data that I'm passing in, and we could say, the first dimension that we're going to look at is we're going to look at the frequency from 0 to 50 hertz, summed up, across all training data. And that'll be this axis. And then this one could be from 50 to 100 hertz. And then we've got points that are like this for one class, and points that are like this for another class, or something like that. That's what we want to get. And so with SVM, it doesn't care these are frequency, it doesn't care that it's whatever. All it does is it just separates them as best it can. And so when you're doing this kind of um, when you're doing this kind of learning, oftentimes the kind of data ranges of your input data are important. Things like, um, for instance, in the K nearest neighbors example, we were looking at accelerometer data and also compass data. The compass data goes from 0 to what, 6.2 something, right? 2 pi. And the accelerometer data goes from like negative 2 to 2 or negative 4 to 4 or something like that. Some of the data you're going to process is going to be, have a much different range. Some of it might go from like negative 100 to 100. And so when you're doing things like SVM or like k-nearest neighbors or linear models or whatever, when you're calculating the distance between this point and the surrounding points, for example, for, for k-nearest neighbors, you don't want all of your gyroscope data to be like this and all of your uh, accelerometer data to be like this. Because then what happens is you, your, your variance along one axis is really, really small. Your variance along another axis is really, really large which means that the data that's along this axis is going to dominate the data along this axis because the distance is always going to be how far am I from the nearest point along this axis because this distance will never be very large. So oftentimes you will have to normalize your data so that this one goes from negative 1 to 1, this one goes from negative 1 to 1, that kind of thing. You get more and more and more abstract the better and better and better your uh, machine learning is because you separate yourselves further and further from the physical intuition of, oh, these are units. No, all the numbers become unitless. They go from negative one to one because you don't want the distance metric to get dominated by one point being really, really far away, but proportionally not really that far away because you just have a huge range on your data. So part of this is knowing how you should pre-process your data before putting it into the learning thing. So yep. like for why you're doing the FFT rather than just putting in the raw audio samples or something like that. Right. So one of the reasons why I don't put in the raw audio samples is because we've already seen that what we're going to do is we're going to take our data, turn it into an array of floats, and throw it into SVM. 
right? The first reason why we don't do that is because if we just throw our audio data in, it's going to be like a 480 dimensional problem. Now computers are pretty good at dealing with large dimensions, but the more dimensions you have, the longer it's going to take to calculate whatever you are trying to calculate. Because when we are searching for those basis functions to warp from low dimension to high dimension, we have to try out different permutations of different dimensions to figure out which dimension do I you know, put my uh, big lumpy thing on so that I can cut it with a hyperplane. So the more dimensions you have, the longer it's going to take in order to find a model that works. So if I just take 480, um, 480 samples, shove them into the thing and hope for the best, it's not going to work very well, and that's not even long enough to hold a single word, right? 480 samples is like a hundredth of a second. The, the amount of data that I'm recording there is in the, like, hundreds of thousands of samples. And doing a hundred thousand uh, dimensional machine learning problem is going to require a supercomputer. It's not going to work on a phone. So a lot of what we do when we do feature detection or, or making feature uh, vectors is we take our data and we somehow distill it down into the fewest possible numbers that will separate our data in the feature space. Feature space being this, one feature versus another feature. Or this, you know, one feature versus one feature versus one feature. So when you're designing machine learning algorithms, the key challenge for you as a programmer is what features do I use and why? Because you can always just add, make your feature vector longer and longer, add more and more dimensions, but your computational complexity will increase. And given, most of the computational complexity is going to happen at training time, which should be happening on a computer or a server or something, versus classification time, which happens on your phone. Well, okay, that's not exactly how it's been working, what we've been talking about so far, but that's the way most of this stuff does work. For instance, Google has speech recognition that runs on the phone, which is actually pretty impressive. Most people don't have that kind of thing. They have like a 50 megabyte large file that sits on your phone and is a model. It's like the SVM model thing that we train up here. And it is all of the knowledge that the machine learning algorithm has been able to kind of wring out, distilled down into the rules that decide whether something is belongs to, you know, word this or word barn. And the way it does that is just it stores just the decision boundaries and the functions that need to work from here to there. Because you don't actually need the data points once you've learned where the decision boundaries are. All you need are the decision boundaries. So we can take our data, we can turn it into features, and then we can use our decision boundaries to decide do these features represent a word that means this or a word that means barn. And generating those decision boundaries is the hard part. That's what happens on the, in the cloud, on the computer, offline, whatever. And so at some level, reducing complexity there doesn't matter as much because we can always plug another server into the farm and you know, work harder. But making it as fast as possible on the phone where all we're doing is classification, that is still a concern. And so increasing dimensionality does still increase that a little bit. So we try and keep that down as much as possible. We try and keep the dimensions as low as possible. So on this slide way back when, where I say, uh, from our perspective, most of the work is in step number one, where we construct future vectors out of our data, that's what I mean. Is for most of us, it's not even programming work. It's like design work. We have to decide what is going to separate our data. So for the K nearest neighbors, the way that I process the data that's being handled on the phone is I take my input data, which is like pitch, yaw, roll, it's going to be accel acceleration vectors, that kind of stuff. And first I did like, you know, I took the acceleration vector, I squared it, I squared all the individual elements, summed them up, and then I filtered them. And the reason I filtered them is I passed them through a low-pass filter so that I have some idea of memory. Like, I'm not only looking at the current reading, I'm looking at the current reading plus a couple further back, right? That's what a low-pass filter does, is it, it takes your data that's going like this and kind of makes it remember what it was before and makes it much smoother and such. 
And so the reason I did that is because um, it will reduce noise, it will make the readings not fluctuate as quickly. So if I'm in the yes class, I won't switch to the no class and then back to the yes class super quickly. I will kind of stay in one, then stay in another, that kind of thing. And so that kind of design is the kind of thing that you do when you are coming up with your feature vectors in order to be able to perform machine learning on those feature vectors. Any questions? So you were saying, so you make it sound like you design the feature vector thing, but as far as I can tell, you just call that library and kind of does it for you, <laughs> right? So the feature vectors are what I pass into the library, saying oh. this is my data. It, oh, it creates the models and stuff, but the feature vectors are, I have a feature vector that's two numbers, and I say, this is an example of me shaking the device. I have a feature vector that's two other numbers, and I say okay. this is an example of me not shaking the device, that kind of thing. Okay. But then you were saying earlier that we, as a designer, kind of have to decide how many dimensions we, we want, right? Yep. To, uh, I guess, save computational resource. Yep. But how do you, is that specified when you call that library, or where is it specified? So, for example, in K nearest neighbors, it's completely implicit in how big my feature vector is. So here in K nearest neighbors, in the code, I have this thing called calculate feature vector, and I have this thing called FV, which is my feature vector, and I make it a float array that's too long, right? And then I say, okay, the zeroth element is this acceleration vector magnitude, and the first element, I'll add it back in, is this uh, attitude.yaw thing. And so, if I were to add more things in here, the way that I've coded up my k nearest neighbors algorithm will just use however many dimensions there are. Oh, okay. The only prerequisite is that all of your feature vectors have to be of the same dimensionality, right? You can't compare a two-dimensional vector and a three-dimensional vector. If you're going to use three dimensions, you use three dimensions throughout your entire program's lifespan. If you're going to use two dimensions, you use two dimensions throughout the whole lifespan. Same with SVM. With SVM, you will say, I'm going to have four features which are just four floating point numbers. And then it'll say, okay. And so you just pass in four numbers and it says, okay, that's one, that's one feature vector. You pass in another four numbers, it'll say, okay, that's another feature vector, etc." Do they have to be of a certain data type? Like, do they have to be close, or could one of the feature vectors be a bitmap? Um, it'll, it's always all floats. And that's pretty standard for machine learning algorithms. You will just, you'll take your bitmap, and you will either pass in the bitmap complete as, you know, one pixel is one floating point number, another pixel is another floating point number, or even one pixel is four floating point numbers, one for red, one for green, one for blue, one for alpha, one for that. You know, that will make your dimensionality explode pretty quickly. So what most people do is they take your bitmap and they do feature extraction on that bitmap to turn it into a small enough amount of numbers. So for instance, there's a great feature set called SIFT. Some of you guys who have been doing the image processing thing, um, some of you guys who are doing the image processing thing came across this. It's called the Scale Invariant Feature Transform. You take your image, you shove it into SIFT, and it does this. It will take your image, and it will find what it thinks are interesting points in your image. So those red dots are where it has found interesting points. And so you take the output of all the SIFT features, and that's what you shove into a machine learning program. So you'll take these interesting points, you'll shove it into the SVM, then you'll take like a picture of this same image from a different viewpoint, take those SIFT features, take it from a different viewpoint, take those SIFT features, blah, 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 keep on doing that, and eventually the SVM will build up an idea of what this image looks like. And then you will be able to look at it from any vantage point, and it will actually be able to detect it it will be able to say, this is the image that you trained me on, not a different one. That's the kind of thing that machine learning algorithm, or that image computer vision machine learning algorithms tend to do, is they will take your image, <clears throat> break it down into features, and then do machine learning on those features in order to say, hey, this is the letter A, because I know what the letter A looks like, because I have seen letter A from every different possible angle before, right? Is this fast enough to be able to do on a video stream? Like, so it's, once you have a model, it 
takes a certain a little bit amount of time, like maybe one second, to really crunch the model again? Yeah, actually. So um, next week, we are going to be doing face detection. And the way that we're going to be doing it is through what's called the Violet Jones algorithm. Sorry, the Violet Jones algorithm. And it is a machine learning algorithm that will take your data and figure out where in the rectangle there's a face. And we'll be doing it live on a live video you know, stream that's passing through an inch processing component and stuff. And it'll just draw yellow rectangles around people's faces. It's pretty cool. And it works a lot of the time? Yeah, yeah, it works pretty well. So. Uh, in this particular case, on our phone, the code that I had last year couldn't quite do it 30 frames per second. It could get maybe 24 frames per second or 20 frames per second, but that's still pretty good. There are ways to speed it up, and so maybe if I have some time this week, I'll speed it up so that it looks really, really nice for the demo next week. But um, that's just one way of doing it. Another way is called eigenfaces, and we'll be covering that, and we'll see how fast that's able to run if I actually you know, write it up. And there are other ways as well. Like, for instance, these SIFT features can be used to do face detection. Uh, more than that, it can be used to do specific face detection. So, for instance, you can use these SIFT features to do things like tell the difference between like me and Cindy's face, right? It will find features that are around my eyes and around my mouth and my beard and stuff. It will find stuff that's around her hair and her eyebrows and her eyes and stuff. And you will be able to look at the features and figure out, oh, this person is this person and that. I know, for us, it's not that hard, right? <laughs> for, for us humans, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between me and Cindy. But for a computer, you have to be extremely explicit about what you're talking about. And doing something without machine learning to try and solve that kind of a problem is, like, impossible. Machine learning is built to solve problems like this. And so in order to... Uh, you know, you can imagine if I had said, instead of finding red rectangles, tell the difference between one person's face and the other, you wouldn't even know where to start. And some people have tried to do this kind of thing. Eigenfaces is actually a very mathematically well-founded, very intuitive way of doing this. And it works okay, but it's not perfect. So we'll be talking about that next week as to why it's okay, why it's not perfect. And the reason I did this lecture before that lecture is so that now I can use all the machine learning lingo and such in order to talk about this is what I mean by we're using a machine or learning algorithm to do face detection. All right. Any other questions? Here's kind of a stupid one, but if you do SIFT first and then you pump it in or anything in the Fourier transform, you put it into this SVM, the lib SVM thing, or to do machine learning, you still have to, that'll only give you the model after whatever. So then every time you do the computation, like on a video, it wouldn't be wise because then you have to do the SIFT every time, right? Yep, you would have to do, so your feature extraction algorithms have to be fast enough to run in real time. That's true. And so you want as little processing as possible before you feed it into the SVM. Yes, yes, absolutely. Most machine learning is, okay, I shouldn't say that. A good chunk of machine learning is never even designed to run in real time ever. So things like Siri, it's not really real time, right? You say, you're like, you know, show, tell me where the nearest gas station is. And then it thinks about it for a little bit, and then it sends it back to you. And they manage to get it running fast enough, but it's not really real. It's not like, you know, you're speaking and the words appear as you're speaking them. No. Or if they do, there's some kind of delay, right? So that's how most machine learning things work. Now, we are getting fast enough internet connections, fast enough phones, that kind of thing, so that, like, I think, if Siri doesn't do this, I would be surprised. I think she, I think she does, but I know that Google's stuff does this. As I speak, the, I know she, right? I do that all the time. Um, I call it that. Yeah, I, I work on a programming language called Julia, and I refer to the language as a she all the time. I don't, it's something to do with, like, you know, mariners call the ship a she, that kind of thing. Anyway. Um, so, you start speaking, and your words will actually start appearing as you speak into your phone, which is pretty cool. And our internet connections are fast enough that it is possible for it to actually send the words out, have it run on some, like, cloud, you know, thousands of computers that are able to take your audio and turn it into words in milliseconds and send it back over the wire to you, 
we're actually getting to be that fast with uh, internet connections, which was absolutely unheard of, you know, 10 years ago. Which means that 10 years from now, we're going to be surprised if it takes more than a second for it to recognize anything, right? Should be instantaneous. Should be instantaneous, exactly. I don't think I even answered your question. What was your question? No, my question was, I guess the point of this is, if you want to speed it up, if you want to put as much into the model as possible and as little pre-processing yes. as possible, yes. no Fourier transform, if you can suspend it or do it. That's exactly right. Now, fast Fourier transforms are fine. I mean, pretty much everybody can do that in real time, no problem. I mean, we were doing like hundreds of Fourier transforms per second earlier in the class, and our phones weren't even breaking a sweat. With That's what I'm wondering, yeah, is what's, what's, what's ideal for a preprocessor? Right, well, I mean, that totally depends on your hardware, right? Yeah. Even three years ago, cell phones couldn't do live Fourier transforms. Now they can do hundreds of them per second, and it's not a problem. So it's, uh, it's really a matter of knowing the hardware that you're on and what you can do. And the way to do that is not with pencil and paper, right? Like, you can try and be like, oh, computational class, O, big O of n times m, whatever. Really, the way that you're going to do this is you're going to write the code, you're going to try and run it, and you're going to see, oh, it doesn't work, or it's just too slow. Try something bad. And then you just try something else. It's a lot of trial and error, this kind of stuff, because a lot of the time, you can get, I mean, after a while, you'll start to get an idea, like an intuitive sense of, oh, I can't touch every pixel in the image, right? That's a good, that kind of uh, first idea to know, is I can't touch every pixel in the image, every frame, which means that I need to have an algorithm that will look at you know, this chunk of the data, but not these other chunks of the data. Or you will come up with clever algorithms that do a bunch of work at the beginning, and then have less work to do later on. You know, like you have a lib video thing where it looks at the entire frame the first time, and then all it does is it looks at the places that it identified as interesting last frame. And if they move, then it will look at the new part of the frame that moved in, and that kind of thing. That's the kind of cleverness that you have to do when you have too much data. Any other questions? This is fun. You guys are coming up with all sorts of questions. How intense is this SIFT algorithm? <sighs> well, uh, somebody showed me an OpenCV example on their phone the other day, which was doing SIFT in almost real time to an image. It was getting probably five or six frames per second. Um, so, okay, there is a image processing class that I took here at the University of Washington where we use these SIFT features in order to build panoramas. It was actually one of my favorite homeworks of all time. We, we did everything from, we took a bunch of pictures with our camera. We had the parameters for what our lens looks like, so how the lens is going to warp the image. So you undo the warping. Then you do sift on all, of the, uh, on all of the images that find these points. And so what you rely on is the fact that sift will find the same kinds of points because a point from this vantage point is going to still be interesting when I look at it from this vantage point. That's the underlying assumption. And so then you find the sift features that match each other, and that allows you to align your images. And then you can build one big image out of it. That kind of thing on a, like... We had maybe 10 images that were each like two megapixels because it was this crappy old point and shoot. That process took maybe 20 seconds on my laptop. So that took quite a while in terms of processing. There are SIFT implementations that are much better optimized than the stuff that I wrote at 3 a.m., which will take you know, maybe a second to, op to operate on 10 images. So there are SIFT implementations that are pretty darn fast. The SIFT isn't that complicated. It's just a little bit of math. It's like you take your, you take your image and let's see, where is it? Ba, 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 ba. I guess they don't really talk about it. Here we go. You take your, no, that's not it. Anyway, you basically take your image, you do like derivatives in different directions to find things that have sharp changes. You find peaks in that derivative image, and you take a little neighborhood around it and do some twiddling to make it so that it doesn't rotate with the image. Uh, because you don't want the SIFT image like this to look different from the SIFT image like this. You want the SIFT points to look the same across those, so you can still recognize the same location, 
regardless of how you've rotated your image. And so, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is you can do this in pretty close to real time, but it will take work to optimize it like that. Yes? Um, this reminds me of the other day my boss showed me an iPhone app called Scene that does just this in real time. And on the output video screen, it shows all the points that it finds in interest. That's cool. And as you move the phone around an object in 3D, it tracks the points. And then once you take the 3D picture, it, you can move the accelerometer around and it shows you the item in 3D. That is really cool. what this does. Uh, so it's probably using SIFT or a derivative thereof. There are a couple derivatives. It's probably doing that. So, okay, one of the things that we don't really talk about in this class is how to do data parallel computation. Data parallel computation is where you use either multiple threads or in the worst slash best case scenario, the GPU, to do the same thing to different pieces of data all at once. So for instance, you could imagine our phone has multiple cores. So we could have one core, we could have one thread that processes the left half of the image and one thread that processes the right half of the image and then take the results, merge them together at the end and do whatever. That's the kind of thing that will allow what he's talking about to work really, really well. Our phone has how many cores? At least two. I think it might even have four cores. It has, well, I may not be able to find it that easy. Let's try doing a wiki for it. Wiki usually has this kind of stuff. It has dual core, so it's got two cores. So that means that we will be able to run two threads at the same time without any kind of contention, and they will do that work simultaneously. Now, that will give us a two times speed up. This phone has four cores, so I can get a four times speed up by doing that kind of thing. And of course, the processor here is newer than the one in there, so it's a little bit faster, etc., etc. On the extreme end of the spectrum, we have graphics processing units, which are built for graphics processing. They're built for, you want to do things like make an image more red, which means that you want to perform a very simple operation to every single pixel in your image. A modern day like desktop graphics processor has hundreds of thousands of cores inside of it, but they don't have the ability to do different instructions. They all have to perform the same instructions. They'll just get their data from sequential locations in memory. So you can take a huge vector and chunk it through the uh, processor in one go, and it will do things like multiply it by five and subtract one to all of them all at once, that kind of thing. So truly real-time SIFT implementations will do this kind of thing on the GPU of your phone. They will actually process the data on the graphics card, which is really nice because we're doing basically the same thing to the whole image all the time, and it's just... Um, more advantageous to do that kind of thing on the GPU than on the CPU. But that is like two or three more classes down the road. <laughs> Did this concept of programming threads used to exist? Because I heard like the transition from one to multiple cores in the last decade that like old programs don't run as efficient on the newer processors because they're split up in multiple cores and tend to be lower frequency when you have multiple cores. So multi multi core programming really started to hit its stride about 10 years ago when we started to get like dual core and stuff. We did have machines that had multiple like discrete processors on the board, but there's a difference between cores and processors. Cores share some uh, resources, like they share the same interface to get memory from RAM, whereas multiple processors have their own dedicated RAM, that kind of thing. Um, so to get this kind of, to get threads to really help you, you need, for, for data parallel processing, you need to have multiple distinct execution units. So either multiple cores or more, multiple processors. With multiple cores, we get you know, multiple execution units in a single package. And uh, nobody really did that until we had those kinds of things prevalent everywhere. Because if you have multiple threads on a single core machine, all that happens is one thread works for a while, then it stops, then another thread works for a while, then it stops, then another thread works for a while, and you get no speed up. So older, compute, older programs aren't necessarily punished by working on a multi-core system, but they don't take advantage of the other cores at all. So one core will be working while the other ones are just sitting there doing nothing. Um, 
the idea of data parallel programming is really, uh, I wouldn't say really new, but it's really hitting its stride nowadays, now that it's pretty common to have four cores instead of a phone, which is just ridiculous. Um, and we have like eight cores inside of desktop CPUs, which is pretty standard as well. So um, kind of the way people theorize it's going to go is GPUs are getting more and more capable in the different kinds of instructions they can do and having like half the GPU do this, half the GPU do that. CPUs are getting more and more cores and keeping how they're able to each one perform different operations. So eventually we're going to get to the point where the GPU and the CPU are basically the same. We're going to have hundreds if not thousands of cores that can all do their own thing or efficiently kind of all do the same thing at the same time to different data. And we won't really have the distinction between GPUs where you have kind of simple idiots that are in drones versus CPUs where you have individual geniuses that are very few in number. You'll just have kind of the best of both worlds. But that's probably another 10 to 20 years away. Is that where they're headed? I saw like some companies like Intel and AMD, they're switching from CPUs to like APUs where they wouldn't have been? Or is that a way to We can get into really in depth with this, but it's pretty off the top of the class. <laughs> so you can talk about it with me more after class. Any other questions? Because this is the end of today's lecture. The lectures now are going to be a little bit shorter because they're just kind of individual topics. So I will be upstairs until the last person leaves. So you can talk to me about previous homeworks or your final projects or whatever. It's basically office hours after the class from now on. So with that, good night. Yeah,